so good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining the webinar there's um pe <coughs> people joining us all the time but uh, i think we should get on with this just to let you all know that we are recording the webinar it will be um available on the ESIS youtube channel uh, later on today um and i hope that you all enjoy it uh, my name's Kevin Raynard. I'm the medical director with the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team. Uh, and today I'm joined by Tara, Steve and Jyoti, who will introduce themselves more formally as they talk about um, uh, the subject matter of the webinar today. Uh, just in terms of brief introduction, the uh, as you'll all know, there's been a large focus on uh, the discharge of patients from hospital uh, in the period since Christmas. But one of the areas that's absolutely key to address is how we can reduce the inflow, because the easiest way to have a, uh, a, a simple discharge is not to admit the patient in the first place. So we're going to talk about um, uh, primarily about the, the role of SDEC in that regard and how we can maximise its benefits. And we'll also be touching on the interface between um, SDEC and virtual wards, although there will be another webinar coming up uh, in a couple of weeks time specifically about virtual wards. So with no further ado, I'll ask Crystal to bring up Tara's slides and Tara's going to start with delivering a short presentation. Um, we are we really want people to uh, participate in the webinar. So after the presentation, uh, then please either put your hand up or type questions in the chat box and we will uh, try and get a lively discussion uh, involving both the presenters and yourselves. So thank you very much and over to you, Tara. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks for the invite for, um, for today. Um, my name is Tara Seed. I'm the National Clinical Lead for Same Day Emergency Care with NHS England of Improvement. And uh, we, we're going to do a slightly different presentation today. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how same day emergency care can support admission avoidance. As Kevin said, thinking about alternatives to admission for patients who are coming to the front door and, alter and an alternative front door um, for acute care. Um, so just to recap on the definition of SDEC, uh, for those who are a bit rusty, SDEC is a model of care that allows specialists where possible to care for patients within the same day of arrival as an alternative to hospital admission. Uh, removing delays for patients requiring further investigation and or treatment. And I think it's really important that we focus on that as an alternative to hospital admission. So SDEC is a space where we are adding value to the patient journey. These are patients who would have required admission to a hospital bed. It is not a space where we are managed patients with minor injuries or minor illness. It is not a replacement for a minor's area of, of a, an emergency department. So this is about adding proper value to patient journeys. SDEC should be considered for all patients where clinically appropriate to support alternatives to admission. And we're looking now an, at an SDEC by default uh, uh, process rather than a sort of pathway driven process for patients with certain clinical conditions who might be suitable for SDEC. So the national ambition is for, an, for SDEC by default for patients presenting with acute um, and urgent problems. Next slide, please. And why is this important? Well, um, you'd have to have been living under a rock to have missed what's been happening this winter. Um, and although this happens most winters, it's been particularly bad this winter. So our um, ambulances are having very prolonged offload times because our emergency departments are full, because we don't have any additional capacity to respond to the demand um, that we are facing, which is unprecedented. And in, in addition to that, we have got unprecedented um, levels of exit block from our emergency departments with high levels of bed occupancy. So we really need to look at an alternative 
place for patients with urgent or acute healthcare needs to be managed who don't require admission. Um, so we can maintain the capacity in emergency departments for those more unwell patients or patients who might need specific procedures that, that require an emergency department um, remit. Um, and it's really now key uh, to drive those changes whilst we're planning for next winter, although we're in tw winter 2022 20, at the moment, but thinking about moving forwards uh, for next winter, planning what we need to do going, going forwards. Next slide, please. So alternatives to admission have to start pre-hospital, as Kevin suggested. Um, we need to think about what alternative services we can uh, support development of and champion to allow patients to have their healthcare needs met in an alternative space. And that might be uh, via 111, using uh, additional community services, self-care advice, specialist um, advice via Consultant Connect and using more pharmacy and dental services in the community. And then as we're moving through the patient journey, as they, if patients are more unwell, who might require attendance to secondary care, thinking about use of same-day emergency care services, thinking about frailty, same-day emergency care, and those short stay units. And on the other flip side of that, you've got the virtual ward model, which has been really <clears throat> strongly developed during the pandemic to support patients either um, avoiding admission, um, but in, in conjunction with some same day emergency care services and some early discharge services so that patients may be discharged from hospital uh, earlier, but may have ongoing monitoring for deterioration in their own home. And all of this has to really join up together. Um, next slide, please. And thinking about those other alternatives now in a bit more detail, uh, thinking about access. So direct referral to SDEP via 111 has really taken off in the last year. We've now got 267 active uh, SDEP service types on the DOS um, and lots of services are now um, receiving direct referrals from 111 and now 999. And whilst that's been slow to increase in activity, I think we've reached a point now where that's really starting to increase um, quite significantly as patients and clinicians get more used to that, that way of working. Next slide, please. Um, thinking about other ways that we might integrate that pre-hospital uh, decision-making process. This is um, a pilot that was done in, in Oxfordshire uh, with SCAS um, and it was around a call, a call before you convey or a talk before you convey approach where um, ambulance clinicians were able to speak to senior uh, decision makers before they conveyed patients to hospital to think about alternatives to admission. And um, on a one day pilot, they um, managed to divert 65% of potential conveyances to other services and not convey those patients to hospital. So that's a really um, innovative way of thinking and also meant that those patients didn't have to go to secondary care and could be managed closer to home. So not only good for patients, but also good for good for services as well. Next slide, please. Thinking about virtual monitoring and strategies to uh, support patients being monitored, monitored virtually in the community. Obviously, this took off massively during the pandemic uh, with the development of virtual wards and um, primary care oximetry, led oximetry at home for patients with COVID, um, with ongoing monitoring for deterioration in their own homes. And patients have obviously become very familiar with this concept. And indeed, it's become very acceptable to patients to be monitored at home rather than being admitted to hospital. So this is another strategy, strategy that we can use to manage patients safely, being monitored for deterioration in their own homes, um, but avoiding admission or reducing their length of stay. Next slide, please. And thinking then about that decision to admit for patients who may attend uh, an emergency department, thinking about criteria, criteria to admit. This is obviously uh, one of the decision support tools with, for criteria to admit that people may want to use um, to support their decision making um, around uh, whether patients can require admission or whether they can be safely discharged if you've got those proper safety net processes in place. Next slide, please. 
So the same day strategy from NHS England and Improvement encompasses all of the aspects of same, same day emergency care. And when you're designing your SDEC services and thinking about the bits that might need a bit more tweaking, I think it's helpful to use this framework um, that we have that's uh, helpfully in the acronym same day. Next slide, please. So thinking about what you might need, the key ingredients, sorry, next slide, just press enter, thanks. Um, looking at your staffing to make sure that your staffing is safe and sustainable. And I'll we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And that your access is integrated and system wide. So we've been talking a bit about 111, 999 and how you can have direct access, access via those services, but thinking also about your direct access from primary care um, and other services that may want to feed into your same day emergency care um, service. Monitoring and evaluation, so ongoing monitoring and evaluation to define and report patients suitable for same day emergency care. So that's those patients who we are really adding value to, as I said, uh, making sure that your estate is maximised across your healthcare system um, and making sure that your diagnostics and testing capacity supports rapid access to same day services so that patients who are attending same day services have parity of access to diagnostics and testing in, in the same way that patients attending the emergency department would have access to those investigations. Thinking about alternatives to admission, we discussed that a little bit and I'm hoping we're going to discuss that a bit more uh, later on this, this lunchtime. Um, and then really and most importantly, you. So culture around same day emergency care and delivering alternatives to admission um, is absolutely the key thing that leads to the change in how people think and manage their organisations. So you have the opportunity to facilitate change by developing a culture of inclusive and compassionate leadership. So the change comes from within and we've seen lots of amazing clinical leaders spring up during the pandemic who've had the opportunity to really showcase their innovative um, ability and we really, really want to continue with that. Next slide, please. So thinking about staffing going forwards, obviously everyone is struggling with workforce at the moment and this is not something that we can suddenly magic up overnight and we do have to grow our own workforce. Um, patient, um, doctors now thinking about portfolio careers um, and HE have obviously now thinking about um, the medical um, medical education reform programme and thinking about the enhanced programme, looking at developing practitioners who've got uh, different skill sets and um, a more generalist skill set. So um, HE have, are already ahead of the curve with this and developing those clinicians for the future with generalist skills. Thinking about the MDT workforce and obviously advanced care practitioners, advanced level practitioners are the absolute backbone of our SDEC services across the country and we really need to support development of this key workforce. So our CHEM and our CP have developed uh, frameworks for training for these, for these really, really important clinicians. We want to encourage more organisations to support development of advanced level practice. Thinking about a capabilities framework and that's linked to tasks rather than specific professional groups and so that we can have an MDT, a truly MDT workforce that can deliver all of the care and the tasks that we need to deliver in our SDEC services and sharing best practice and really I think that's one of the sad things about the pandemic is that we haven't been able to get in a room and discuss things and have those conversations but we do have some information on our futures web platform and I know your sister amazing at sharing best practice and um, and developing those networks so we can talk to each other we haven't got time to reinvent the wheel so it's really important that we have those relationships and conversations next slide please there are some uh, staffing tools and resources uh, available to you if you want to look at these to think about your staffing profiles. And I think or, uh, a big pack went out to the system a couple of days ago with all of this in it. So looking at uh, example staffing models. So there's nine sites in this um, in this document. They're all very different. So that to act as templates for, for you as a starter for 10 if you're if you're thinking about developing your staffing model. The ESIS demand and uh, capacity tools have been adapted to support uh, same day emergency care and that's an Excel spreadsheet. And then the HE workforce modelling tool has also been adapted to support SDEC. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a screenshot of the ESIS um, 
same day emergency care staffing tool that I think everybody should have access to now through their organisations. Next slide, please. And so we've also developed this sort of task and skill set framework. So just again, expanding on that concept of, of that we need a sort of task based uh, workforce that has interchangeable um, interchangeable skills rather than it being a sort of person based uh, framework um, and thinking about what you need at all levels of your SDEC service um, and what tasks can be done by different people and the suggested roles for those people who are delivering those tasks. So that's just an easy to read document that's available on our, our futures web page. Next slide, please. Other things to consider around your estate. So your proximity to your type one ED with that developing that emergency floor concept, that hot floor concept. We know that there's massive efficiencies if your estate service is co-located with your ED uh, or all your sort of acute services, including your MAU. Thinking about your access to diagnostics and how many consulting rooms, patient trolleys and chairs you need. On average, from our benchmarking audit, sites have got 17 assessment spaces. Um, but thinking what you need for your service is really important when you're if you're designing it de novo. And really, really importantly, at the moment, beds should not be provided in, S, in an SDEC unit. I mean, obviously, this is a complete own goal. It's going to have a negative impact on your patient flow, because often first thing in the morning, coming into an empty SDEC uh, space is really, really helpful to start getting patients through the system early on in a timely fashion. Um, so bedding patients in SDEC really, really and you, is, is a no-no if SDEC areas should not be used as an escalation space. Um, next slide, please. We've just um, produced a document uh, really to support sites to protect their uh, same day emergency care uh, space and services through, through the exceptional circumstances that we're living and working through at the moment. Um, and obviously there's lots of reasons why uh, we shouldn't bed our estate services. I've already said about flow, but also about patient experience. Obviously most of these place, spaces aren't designed to have bedded patients in them. And also thinking about your staff being pulled from pillar to post um, and your workforce, um, thinking about what how that feels to staff every day, constantly being moved around and looking after patients that they're not necessarily used to looking after. So that's really important. So we, we really must protect our estate services to stay unbedded in, in these challenging times. Next slide, please. Other things to consider around your estate estate. Um, sustainability measures. Obviously, as we move now to uh, developing some more virtual uh, support for patients who may just need a telephone consultation. Obviously, that's very environmentally friendly and goes with the greener NHS agenda, but also thinking about what you're using within your services and making sure that they're uh, sustainable. Um, making it dementia friendly, um, thinking about housekeeping. Patients may, that may be there for uh, a, a sort of four to six hours. Um, on average, patients stay 276 minutes in aesthetic services across the country, and that's from our benchmarking audit. So a cup of tea or coffee and a sandwich might, might be very welcome. Uh, thinking about your pharmacy services to support TTAs and also medicines reconciliation for your older frail patients is really, is really useful. And of course, infection prevention control measures are absolutely vital. Next slide, please. An SDEC is a coat of many colours, as we know. We've traditionally focused on medical conditions, but actually SDEC is for all. Uh, it's a multicoloured uh, coat of uh, lots of different specialties and obviously there are lots of specialties have already developed uh, their own uh, SDEC services including and especially gynaecology and paediatrics who've been doing a lot of same day emergency care for a long time um, and now thinking about other uh, other specialties including surgery and during the pandemic obviously infectious disease uh, specialties really developed desk tech services around COVID and now moving forward thinking about other respiratory illness that might be amenable to same day emergency care or virtual ward uh, management is, is key to maintaining our IPC pathways. Next slide please. So uh, Steve's going to talk a bit more about virtual wards and virtual care but just thinking about how that works with SDEC. Uh, obviously there you have your community services that might be delivering virtual wards but how can 
we develop some kind of virtual support for patients who might need uh, ongoing monitoring for deterioration from our SDEC services. Um, and that's really uh, with the same principles that we deliver SDEC. So it's investigation, treatment and management of a patient who presents in an emergency on the same day without requirement for admission to a hospital bed. Next slide. And really around supporting virtual care, SDEC has all the key ingredients that you need. So rapid access to diagnostics and investigation, hospital-based services without admission, with ongoing monitoring for deterioration and using innovative technology. And that's really the adjunct now with virtual care to what we've already got within our SDEC services. And most importantly, designing what you need locally for your patient population. Next slide, please. <coughs> so finally, and as, as I said before, most importantly, now, as um, we've got a few minutes uh, today uh, out of our very, very busy lives, and I know the system is very challenged at the moment, just using this time to think about how we develop our collective leadership strategy, how we uh, move forward together um, and become those leaders for change, um, because that's that's going to be the key driver now as we move forward. And I know people are tired and really fed up of, of having to think, but we've got a few minutes this lunchtime to, to, to think outside the box and do a bit of innovation. So um, it's a safe space and I think anything goes. Um, next slide, please. So thinking about that culture of senior decision making, uh, how you're going to get your exec and your operational teams on board. And if there's execs and operational teams on, on the call, please support your clinicians and be same day ambassadors. Uh, identify opportunities where collaborative working benefits patients and build and maintain those relationships. And that has been difficult over teams during the pandemic. Um, but so we haven't been able to meet people in person, but that's really, really key. And I'm talking not about just in hospital, out of hospital, but across the boundaries um, uh, and creating an environment that encourages contribution and innovation. Next slide, please. So moving forwards and thinking about uh, how we're going to develop services going forward and how we're going to think about alternatives to admission. I would encourage you all to be disrupted leaders and think about doing things differently. We spend a lot of time putting out fires and solving what we think are the problems, but actually maybe we need to look at things in a different way. Maybe we need to look at the areas that don't normally seem to be problem areas in inverted commas and think about maybe those might be areas that if we change or tweak some things in those areas, maybe that will have an effect on, on the overall process. So we were having a conversation the other day about putting senior decision makers closer to the front door um, and making those early decisions rather than having your most junior people at the front door, um, because that delays decisions in the patient journey and results in patients being admitted to hospital who may not necessarily need to be admitted. And that's really how we're delivering same day emergency care services now is having that senior decision maker early in the patient in the patient journey. So be bold and ambitious, look at the status quo in a different way. Um, I know during the pandemic, lots of people have developed uh, really interesting and new services. And um, we really want to keep going in that way. Let's not go back to thinking about bureaucracy and red tape, but let's really galvanise and capitalise on what we've been doing for the last two years um, and uh, encourage everyone to, to be disruptive. So sorry, Kevin, I've, I've got now, I've got, you've now got a disruptive group on the, on the chat. <laughs> so <laughs> um, thanks everyone for listening. And I think I'm handing over to Steve now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Bardner. I uh, lead for Same Day Emergency Care at University Hospital Sussex East, which is Brighton Haywards Heath. I'm also a clinical uh, associate for ESIS, mainly around Same Day Emergency Care. Um, I don't know, Crystal, have you got that virtual slide, the virtual ward slide? Otherwise, um, yeah, I can bring that up while you're talking. Lovely. OK, so I one of the problems with SDEC, I think, is that we 
we have conversations around SDEC when the SDEC by default model is really about how we manage the acute unscheduled surgical or medical care um, on a day to day basis. It's the heart of that care these days and is not shouldn't really be considered to be a separate entity and it's how we move to that model that unless your patient has already been identified as not being suitable for SDEC, i.e. they are confused, unconscious, requiring high flow oxygen or cannot stand up, then the chances are that the best place for them to be at the start of their journey is an SDEC facility, which then gives you the chance to uh, maximise the possibilities of preventing admission in these patients. And I think that's the best way really to look at this. The other thing is, is that there is a soft spot of what SDEC is in terms of, as Tara's already mentioned, the pathway kind of approach is challenging because there's a sweet spot for all um, conditions of where they kind of fit in into an SDEC uh, mould. Um, uh, too, you know, too mild, and that's really GP or potentially ED care, um, and uh, too too sick, and uh, that's probably not adding too much value. And these patients should be on direct admission pathways. What we certainly have done, and we we're exploring, is this virtual model. And and as Tara says, that is, I think what we should the virtual ward would be more of your kind of standard monitoring through the COVID scenarios, people were at home um, being titrated down of oxygen. So higher levels of monitoring. Um, there's certainly a gap to improve um, access to uh, with the help of the community um, with hospital at home services and GPs to have this model of care which um, has no boundary, governance is very slick, where there's the ability for the same group of uh, personnel that manage SDEC services to offer and hold some clinical responsibility for those patients. But as well as that, we have to be very conscious about the virt um, the SDEC resource that we all have and how we are going to maximise effects. And over time, um, Certainly, we understood that there was a lot of patients coming to the environment who were simply coming because there wasn't any alternative to uh, uh, providing their care. Primary care can provide a follow up blood test within a few days, um, and uh, there wasn't the processes in place for diagnostics to return. There's no such thing as a general medical clinic generally, um, and so. A lot of people were coming back to SDEC after discharge or after their initial assessment for an, another review. So that's led us to have basically a virtual SDEC on top of a physical SDEC so that people can come for their initial review, have a plan and a management and diagnostics in place and a follow up plan, but being moved on to a virtual um, SDEC environment. So they're not coming back unnecessarily. Um, they're having their diagnostics reviewed and follow up telephone conversations, etc., about next steps of management and ongoing follow up without the need to return. Same thing for blood tests. You can get the patients to turn up to phlebotomy anywhere you like, and you can review those tests and then make the phone call about reintroducing certain medication, etc. Um, so the key here on this slide would be clinical conversation, uh, which I think we touched on. Um, I think most clinicians would love the idea to speak to another consultant in a specific specialty to get up to date advice at the point that they are uh, managing patient delivery. Um, and I think acute medicine and other acute services have to suggest that there's people that want to speak to them. And by having senior clini uh, clinicians taking all the calls and so I'm not so in favour of having separate SDEC lines but initial clinical conversation with the appropriate uh, expert 
which then gives the ability for those patients to go to SDEC services when required. And, and but no expectation at the point of that initial conversation as to where the patient's going to go. This is a clinical conversation. This is dynamic. We need to be agile. We know what resources are available at that point in time, and we're going to make the best choice um, for the patient to have value at that time. And this can be very challenging if you're an acute front door clinician because you're probably examining patients and I've certainly been in a situation I'm trying to examine somebody's liver edge and the phone's going off and I've got a choice do I continue with the examination or take the phone call this can be adapted and now we run a model where um, the duty of a single consultant is to field all those community calls and make best judgments across multiple hospitals so we can therefore look at the resource um, across multiple hospitals and make the decision of people arriving at the appropriate time with potentially the scheduled diagnostics in place um, or delaying their attendance until that time um, uh, arrives. I'll probably stop there because I think it's really important that we get some questions and stimulate some debate. Yeah, Th thanks Steve. So if I just pick up some things that are coming in from the chat. So Ar Arvind raises a point that uh, many of the people in Aztec services do raise is that they're being used simply to declutter the ED. So the ED is crowded, so you just move a lot of patients into ASTEC uh, and that makes the ED look better. Obviously ASTEC has a finite resource and if you fill the patients up with, fill ASTEC up with patients who are not at risk of admission, then there's, uh, then you're, you're more likely to, or you're less likely to be able to uh, impact on the admitted pathway. So Steve, what's, what's your approach to being able to target patients who are at risk of admission? So what we, the, the way that we naturally developed um, was to create a exclusion criteria only for our SDEC. So people that just simply would not be manageable on the unit with the resource that we've got. Um, and that's basically those within the criteria to admit to. So people that fall outside of the ability to sensibly be managed the same day emergency care, which then meant that anybody who had been referred and accepted by specialty um, was suitable for SDEC if they weren't being managed um, in an ED on a trolley and needed to stay on the trolley. So that meant that anyone within a any any specialty patient who's sitting in the ED is suitable for SDEC by definition. So th those patients can all come now. Then the next step is is to loosen and make more accepting what is required before a referral to specialty needs to be made. So a classic example, and I'm sure this happens up and down the country, is that somebody pitches up in ED with a post-operative problem. They've had surgery in the last week. Um, there's no uh, ability for direct follow-up or contact to a surgical team, so they come back to ED with their surgical problem. At that point, it should be entirely appropriate that the first clinician, usually a triage nurse in a uh, minors or UTC environment, should be able to refer directly to SDEC under the surgical team for input because there's no value added by ED clinicians or SHOs seeing this patient to then get advice from the surgical team. So that would be you know, the same with cellulitis, for example, if a patient's got some mild cellulitis, then triage um, and streaming should allow that patient to go into GP streams. But if this patient is somebody who's got a grossly red leg, has already been started on antibiotics, then um, triage nurses and, and streamers should be able to refer directly into SDEC because that's where our value is by adding something more than a GP or our ED teams can add. And that you know, in those situations, it's a surgical review or a very high chance of the need for an intravenous um, management of cellulitis. So 
So th thanks, Steve. So one of the other things that's cropping up greatly within the chat is about the role of the clinical conversation and uh, conversation with the senior decision maker. So in terms yeah. of models you've seen around the country, Tara, what, what would you say works best? Um, so I think, as Steve said, if you if you can free up that senior decision maker to have those really important conversations, um, then that's quite important. So having someone who can be a sort of flow coordinator um, so that you're not having the senior decision maker taking every single call, um, but having a sort of a clinician or someone who's quite experienced acting as your navigator and then who can then field the calls and appropriately direct uh, the, the, the sort of calls where a clinical conversation needs to happen to the SDM is um, is quite helpful because otherwise you just get you know conversation fatigue and the phone's going off all the time um, so that that can really um, can really help uh, sort of main, maintain access in a timely fashion to the to the SDM I think um, um, so can, can I just ask you just to expand a little bit further on that in terms of yeah, who who are you seeking referrals from uh, within your asset? Who yeah, who who do you encourage to phone you for yeah. for advice? Um, so we know that the majority of referrals to SDEC come via EDs. So about fifty seven percent are via the ED, um, and it's really important not to just have a a push process. We have to actively pull patients into SDEC. I think that was someone's put that in the chat already, but. It's really important that you have someone competent within your SDEC uh, service to be able to go and find patients that might be suitable for your SDEC service that might be walking around your ED. And a lot of services have a sort of an advanced level practitioner who might be that person that acts as that link between other services in the hospital who goes and actively pulls patients into SDEC. So you're not just running a push model. We need to increase our number of referrals from primary care. Um, so some some units do that really well and have got very good links with primary care and other units not so well and that might be reflective in also the number of referrals um, that your secondary care services might get from primary care in general in that in that in that region. Um, so about sort of a quarter of referrals are from primary care uh, and, and you know we really need to increase that so those patients aren't uh, necessarily requiring going to ED to get that uh, acute assessment but can come via SDEC instead if, if suitable. Um, and then we've got access via 111. Uh, so some services are using Consultant Connect to be able to make those referrals and then you can have a direct clinical conversation with someone within the CAS. Um, and also from 999 via paramedics to be able to have that direct link into a, into a SDEC consultant or a senior decision maker. Um, can enable really, really valuable uh, admission alternative um, pathways to to be uh, to be supported. Uh, thank, thanks, Tara. There, there's some questions um, uh, uh, in the chat about the interface between SDEC and virtual wards. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, do you see that SDEC should run its own virtual ward or is there a should there be a separate virtual ward that SDEC uh, refers into? So so I think we've, we've all got very excited about virtual virtual everything during the pandemic. I mean, um, so we've been all been living a virtual existence for the last two years. Um, but uh, so so I, I think the answer to this is we're, we're very much looking at an overlapping workforce. We're looking at overlapping clinical conditions, looking at overlapping patients. So I, I think we can't be prescriptive about it, but the way that I see it working is you've got these sort of three strands of virtual activity. So you've got your community very much, community-based, probably your frailty services that are integrating in the community with your community-based virtual ward. So that's your care at home. And I think you've got a virtual ward webinar coming up in a couple of weeks where, where the speakers will expand on that a bit more. And then your sort of 
um, virtual wards that might be looking at other clinical conditions that can be managed in the community with ongoing monitoring for deterioration. So your kind of respiratory conditions might fit into that kind of space um, and obviously COVID. And then you've got your virtual wards that are supporting early discharge and they could fit into either of those spaces. They could fit into your community space or potentially in some in some spaces, SDEC might support that, but that's not SDEC, but the SDEC clinicians might support uh, delivery of ongoing monitoring because we don't need to create an additional workforce. In reality, I think these work this workforce that's going to deliver all of this activity is going to be very much interlinked uh, because they're all going to have the same skill set. They're going to be pulling from the same pool. So in reality, you know, our virtual ward runs with the same clinicians that runs runs the SDEC service, for example. Um, but it might be that you've got something very different running in the community for those sort of more frail patients who need a bit more input. And then on top of that, you've got your SDEC patients who might just need a virtual consultation. You might need a, you know, if you're checking bloods or et cetera, you might just need to give them a telephone call rather than them coming back for, for another appointment. So, so there's, there's lots in the virtual space and I think it's all kind of crystallising uh, over the next few weeks. Thank so you. The is virtual, <laughs> that's, that's for sure. That's Steve. <laughs> Yeah, so going back to the kind of clinical conversation, what I, what I would put out there is is that if a if if a consultant led group takes all the all all the referrals, which is entirely possible, um, the amount of time you save is massive. In terms of, you already know why the patient's coming. You've taken a history from 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 the GP. You've turned 25% of referrals into advice and get back to us with, you know, um, uh, get back to us if things are still concerning. Um, so when you go and see these patients later on in the day, the job is much easier. You're in front of the computer, you can see what their imaging is and what their past histories are. And the, it's reducing the amount of time that you spend. It's like the, uh, you know, you may, you may, if you're an, an, a specialist, um, be reviewing referrals um, letters for maybe an afternoon. But if you were sitting there whilst you were doing that with a phone where GPs could call you direct, you'd probably have half as many letters to look at. So it's, it's how we use time differently and the sooner a GP can get advice from a senior clinician, the better course for the patient and the less work there is for secondary care and in fact, STEX. Um, Thank, thanks, Steve. So just to move on to a, uh, a different area, um, Andy Rochford's asking a question about specialty teachologies working uh, in STEX, because I think most STEX is being delivered by generalists, whether they're from um, uh, EM or uh, acute medicine or general surgery backgrounds. So you know, where there's a need for input from knowledgeists, how, how's that best managed and how, how are they best engaged? So who wants to start with that? I'll, 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 I can start there. So um, what you can identify is in the kind of general, if you're say an acute physician, is the level of specialties, uh, specialty um, type patients coming through an STEC area. So, for example, if you're not grossly septic with your jaundice, um, all jaundice will come to us if it's acute. Um, clearly, you could have a jaundice pathway which goes straight to gastroenterology and that's even better. But if, it, if these people are coming on your take and it becomes a large part of your work, then that's ongoing discussion because what's probably then going to happen is that you're using gastro services in an unscheduled way to decide on who's getting the MRCP, etc. after you've done the, the initial workup. And then that's a conversation as has this reached a mass now which can develop into a gastro hot clinic? Do you have the resources for that? And then it's moving on in a transition. So I don't think that there's no size 
fits all. It's a case of what resources have you got available and how do you engage in ologists to or well, you can identify that these patients used to be admitted under you guys in the hospital. Now we're managing them on ESTEC. Um, we need some help with resource and um, that leads to discussions and resolution. Is there anything you want to add, Tara? So I think I think specialties really um, value ESTEC when, when they can see how it works. Um, so what we did with our ESTEC services, we started with a couple of specialty pathways with clinical conditions that were quite common. Um, for example, with our renal team, we had a transplant polyarthritis pathway and a nephrotic syndrome pathway. And then you're, you're, you're basically starting from, from the beginning again, but actually being able to have defined pathways for certain clinical conditions which specialties manage and enabling those clinical conditions to be managed in a very sort of seamless way actually is, is so attractive because the things that really frustrate specialties is getting access to uh, specific investigations, specific um, procedures, space, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, if you can have that all in one place in a very sort of seamless way, that's actually very attractive and very efficient. Um, so that's kind of how we started uh, with our some, some of our specialty SDEC, and, it, and it's been extremely popular. Um, I think it's also really nice to have a space that's away from the emergency department uh, where specialties come and see their patients and get their diagnostic investigations done, but it's it's not so busy and chaotic. Um, and they quite like like working in that kind of environment. Um, so I think I think those are the kind of things that, that act as a big carrot uh, for our specialty patients. Um, Jossie's on the call, I think, and she's an expert on this. So I don't know if Jossie wants to add anything. So is it the specialty? <laughs> Thank you, Tara, for bringing me in. Uh, is it the specialty input into SDEX? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Personally, I feel that this is where we, as Steve uh, alluded to, we need to know what is the proportion of uh, specialty uh, exp expertise you need in the front end. And uh, classically, I think most trusts can do their own work, but uh, usually, uh, Freighty is a big component. Then you've got cardiology, you've got respiratory and gastroenterology in that order. And in some trusts, which are, you know, a bigger trust, you'll have work enough work for endocrinology or uh, perhaps neurology. But depending on the size of the trust and the size of your, uh, you know, uh, expert advice that you need, this should be built into the job plans is what I personally think. So that they are actually given time to do the job and just not being asked to come from clinics and stuff. And, uh, you know, it's an added thing for them. So if it's built into the job plan, it's part of their DCC to do it. And it's expected that they're expected to turn up once a day or twice a day or, or as needed by your rest decks, then that's really done properly and uh, you will get the right advice at the end of the phone by the right person. So these people, uh, once you actually give them the job job to do it, they're not sitting, it's dedicated. They're not sitting somewhere else doing something else and you're not disturbing them. So you feel, uh, you know, good to call them and they are ready to answer as well. And you're talking to the right person first time. Sometimes you feel inhibited if they're really busy and you think I don't want to trouble them. But you shouldn't feel like that when you're asking for advice. You know, that's why job planning is really instrumental to this. Thank, thanks very much, Jyoti. Um, just to move into a slightly different area, what, what's the role, if any, of STEC services in facilitating early discharges from uh, of inpatients? Well, that's something that I have always considered ESTEC to be, which was always outside of what ESTEC was defined as. But I don't, I don't really see a difference between a patient who is currently in the community requiring ESTEC and somebody who is currently in hospital requiring ESTEC. You know, one of the big things is we're trying to avoid admissions, and if what you're doing is reducing length of stay. Technically, that's an avoiding admission in my book, and that's freeing up ED for ED patients and getting patients to, to inpatient beds quickly. 
So there is definitely a role, but I think over time what you can do is ESTEC is where you said when you said about the virtual wards and should they be done by ESTEC, I think ESTEC is a great test bed to test different ways of doing things because ESTECs are culturally very agile and flexible and and with the right leadership you're going to have that kind of mindset and so with our virtual clinic model out of estec what we are now doing is encouraging neurologists and the wards to have their own virtual clinics so they can discharge patients themselves keep them on virtual clinics and review the diagnostic that week or uh, the bloods for follow-up so it's it's we were using it a lot, but the and we still do if it means reducing length of stay, particularly for our acute medicine patients. Um, but I think that it's not necessary. It's 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 going to change over time, uh, whilst um, other people take on the um, kind of aesthetic philosophies. Thanks, and Jyoti. I was just going. Steve just added it in the last minute, so I, that's why I put my head and hand down again. Uh, it it is really it works much better if the wards that are discharging the patients are actually putting them on their own virtual wards rather than bringing them to a generic S deck and there's multiple handovers. I think yeah. So personally, that's that's the way we should be uh, designing our systems. And anything you want to add, Tara or? I mean, I think you need to look at workforce and, you know, it, it is challenging. And as Steve said, SDEX are very agile. We're prepared to try new things all the time. We are trying new things all the time. And the clinicians within those services tend to be very, uh, you know, very innovative and, and, and also very open to, to change or new ideas. Um, if, if you've got a specific specialty issue, potentially it would be better for those patients to be followed up by their own teams. But again, it, it depends what local agreements and arrangements you've got. I just think we need to be really clear that it's not SDEC per se. It can't be counted as that, but it's very, very valuable activity. Uh, and we will need to, going forward, think about how we record that activity because obviously there is there are workforce implications as resource implications um, and we need to make sure that that those those are those are acknowledged so um yeah it, it's all very fast moving but um i think do it and we'll catch up <laughs> it's probably it's probably the mantra i think if the patient needs to come back it's kind mm -hmm. of fits that kind of hot clinic model and that might be working out of your SDEC environment but it should be captured differently okay thank you so um the last area that I just want to touch on was you um, spoke earlier about the importance of the MD team and, and the many different ways in which the workforce is constructed between different units. If you um, uh, had the, the freedom to design the, M, the team that was going to run SDEC uh, in an ideal world, who who would be in the MDT, and what and what's how how would you have your your workforce configured? So I don't know who wants to start with that. Tara, I'll pick on you as, as you've got. No, I'll nice pick on me. <laughs> um, so obviously, you have to have a senior decision maker, and I think that's what we struggle with is having a senior decision maker available for the duration of the period that the service is open. Um, when you're looking at 12 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, it is tricky to provide that. But if 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 you're providing me with carte blanche, that's what I would ask for. And then I would also ask for a workforce that is very adaptable and resilient, um, and that also has good institutional memory, um, because that's really key, because you can then, you have those relationships, not only internally, but also outside and with the community to make sure that you can have that seamless transition between the sort of the, the hospital interface and um, the community. Um, so, uh, Obviously, I'm a big champion of advanced level practitioners, and I think they're fantastic. And um, I would have hundreds of them. Uh, and then um, it's some trainees because we need a workforce for the future. And traditionally, SDEC has not been a space where 
um, where we've had trainees um, and it's now part of the curriculum, Sam, the, the acute medicine training, that people have to have exposure to same day emergency care. Uh, it's also on the Alchem curriculum. So I think developing a workforce for the future is really, really important um, because we're going to have to have portfolio careers. People want to do different things at different times. And I think SFC is a perfect space to develop new skills um, and a new mindset. So uh, trainees are really, really critical to, uh, to providing us with uh, who's going to look after us when we get old or older, <laughs> should I say. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, some of us are there already. Uh, Steve uh, and Jody, is there anything you want to add add to that? Um, no, I was just uh, going to answer this question in the chat box. Not necessarily. I think Tara's covered it brilliantly. <laughs> OK, so the um, there's a question that's uh, just come in the chat box about nurse led. Yeah. SDEC units and whether we've got any evidence or or experience around that. Certainly I've I've seen them in some small um, hospitals on on my travels, but I'm sure that uh, you'll have more experience of that than, than me. Yeah, um, I'll just put in that challenge there is if you're going to that model of this is where your on call services are being maximised, particularly during the day. Um, which would maximise your SDEC in terms of that's where your whole clinical team, whether it's uh, advanced care practitioners, nurses, etc., then how would you ever have a nurse? I think my, uh, my units are nurse led in terms of they are spaces run by nurses and admin where clinician, appropriate clinicians see patients, but I can't envisage that the optimal model would ever be nurse delivered care because um, to maximize SDEC means that probably 70 percent of your activity during daylight hours is coming through for any acute medical take. Okay, Jyoti, anything? I see you commented there about but there's multiple specialties where it's nurse led and consultant supervised. Um, Tara, have you got any comments you want to make? I was just putting it in the chat. I forgot to mention that having a really strong admin team is absolutely critical. Um, they are the face of your service and um, are absolutely key to make sure the whole thing keeps moving all day long. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they really they really are a very key element of, of effective SDEC uh, delivery on a day to day basis and also supported by a very, very strong operational team um, who who and uh, exec team who can champion that culture of same day emergency care is absolutely key. So one quick thing I wanted to add, Kevin, I think the relationships between the SDEX is really important because you cannot always get it 100% right. So your rhabdo pain may end up in any of these places and we should be able to transfer it mutually between the three or four specialties, uh, you know, well. So in the reverse flow where you sometimes say, oh, this is not uh, gynae, send it back to ED. That's that sort of thing should never, never happen. So I think the relationships between the SDEX is really, really crucial. Thank, thank you very much. So I think we're going to need to uh, draw things to a close down. So before we do that, can I just let people know that the, the next webinar is on the 18th of February between 11 and 2, and that's uh, on balancing risk. Um, I'd uh, like to ask people before they do go that Crystal's just going to post a link in the chat for feedback about the webinar that just takes two or three minutes to complete. If people would do that, that would be great and help us to improve the webinars that we deliver. And the last thing I want to do is to thank Jyoti, Steve and Tara for their uh, excellent contributions today. And uh, so thank you very much and thank you all for attending. It's been it's been great and you'll all appear on YouTube shortly. Thank you.